Chapter 8 How do organisms reproduce? Life cycle and reproduction We all know that the lifespan of every organism is fixed and it ultimately dies. Hence, it becomes necessary to produce new living organisms for the continuity of life. How does this happen? Let us understand this concept. All living organisms carry out various life processes such as respiration, nutrition, excretion, etc., which ultimately results in their growth and development. They mature at a certain period of time and then are able to perpetuate and produce offspring that are similar or resemble themselves in all essential features. When growth is complete, eventually their life processes cease and they die. These events, namely birth, growth, producing offspring and death, occur in a cyclic manner one after the other and hence constitute the life cycle of a living organism. For example, in plants, the life cycle begins as the seed germinates and grows into a plant. This is followed by the events of flowering, fruiting and seed dispersal. Seed germinates to produce new plants and the process repeats itself. Do you think in order to stay alive the process of reproduction is as important as the other life processes like nutrition, respiration or excretion? Well, when we compare reproduction with the other life processes like nutrition, respiration or excretion, we infer that reproduction is not essential for an organism to stay alive. A living organism can very well survive without reproducing. Now, if reproduction is not an essential characteristic of life, like respiration and nutrition, then why do living organisms unnecessarily waste their energy in creating new individuals? Why do they reproduce? Reproduction is necessary to maintain the number of individuals of a species. That is why living organisms produce more individuals of their kind to maintain their species on the earth. In this way, the continuity of every living species is maintained. It thereby prevents the extinction of the species. Living organisms produce new individuals of the same species. A new generation of species is produced from the existing individuals. This fundamental characteristic of living things is known as reproduction. For example, in the case of animals like birds and snakes, young ones hatch from eggs. In the case of plants like mango and custard apple, seeds from the fruit germinate into seedlings. Do organisms create exact copies of themselves? All organisms belonging to the same species appear similar. They create new individuals that also look like or resemble themselves. This is very clear from their external morphological features such as the type of leaves, the type of flowers, etc. The genetic material in all living organisms is organized in the form of DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid. The basic process in reproduction is the creation of a DNA copy. Cells use chemical reactions to create copies of their DNA. During this process, there is a possibility of some form of variation since no biochemical reaction can be absolutely reliable. Hence, the DNA copies generated are similar but not identical to the original parent DNA. 
Now, some of these variations can be so drastic that the new DNA cannot adjust to the new cellular machinery it inherits. On the other hand, some of these can actually prove to be beneficial for the new copy of DNA. Let us study the importance of these variations. The population of a particular species fill the well-defined places or niches in an ecosystem. Organisms need to perpetuate the consistency of DNA copying during reproduction for the maintenance of body features. This body design and features allow the organism to use that particular niche. The ecological system undergoes a constant change due to a variety of reasons. Some of these changes are beyond the control of the organisms. For example, fluctuations in temperature, water levels, etc. can affect the ability of the organism to survive. If the population of a species was suited to a particular habitat and the habitat is drastically altered, then there is a possibility that the population could get wiped out. Under such conditions, if some variations were to be present in a few individuals of the species, then there would be some chance for them to survive. The individuals adapted to the new environment allow the survival of the species and thus prevent their extinction. For example, if a population of bacteria is surviving in water and due to global warming the temperature of water increases, most of the bacteria will die. However, few species of bacteria which are resistant to heat will survive and grow further. Thus, we can infer that variation is beneficial to the survival of the species but not necessarily for the individual. Modes of reproduction used by single organisms Unicellular organisms are single-celled organisms. In unicellular organisms, all the life processes, including reproduction, occur in a single cell. Unicellular organisms reproduce through asexual reproduction. In asexual reproduction, there is no union of sex cells or gametes and the offsprings produced are from a single parent. Unicellular organisms differ in the mode by which they reproduce. Let us perform few activities to understand the same. Activity Weigh 10 gram of sugar and keep it in a beaker. Add 100 ml of water to it. Take 20 ml of this solution in another beaker and add a pinch of yeast granules to it. The most common unicellular fungi found in nature are the yeasts. They are available in the form of dried granules. Mix the mixture well and cover the beaker. Place the beaker in a warm place. After one to two hours, put a drop of this culture on a clean slide. Place a cover slip and observe it under a compound microscope. What do you observe? We see that the yeast cells show development of small projections on their outer surface. These outgrowths may develop repeatedly. Later on, each of these outgrowths separate into new individuals from the parent cell. Let us perform another experiment to understand a different mode of asexual reproduction in unicellular organisms. Activity Take a piece of moist bread. Keep it in a plastic bag. Let it stay for two to three days in a moist, warm place. Observe the growth on it after two to three days with the help of a magnifying glass. What do you observe? 
you would observe patches of white cottony mass. Some patches are even yellowish or bluish in color. Some black spots are also clearly observed on the white cottony mass. These white cottony mass is the growth of fungus on moist bread. Now let us compare the results of the activities performed. From the first activity, we could understand that the yeast cells show a small outgrowth from the parent cell. This small outgrowth then develop repeatedly and separate itself from the parental cell and live independently. On the other hand, the fungus grows on a piece of moist bread and forms cottony mass. Thus, from the activities performed, we can infer that different organisms reproduce depending on the body design and the conditions prevailing. Let us study different modes of reproduction in unicellular organisms. Fission In unicellular organisms, cell division of fission is a method of producing new individuals. In this process, the body divides into two parts. Many different patterns of fission can be observed in unicellular organisms. One of the type of fission is binary fission. Let us study more about binary fission. Binary fission Binary fission is an important mode of asexual reproduction. Most of the prokaryotes reproduce through binary fission. These include bacteria and some protozoans like amoeba and paramecium. Some of the eukaryotes, for example, euglena, also follow binary fission. In this method, the parent cell divides into two equal or nearly equal parts. Each of these parts is an individual cell and has the potential to grow and get to the same size as that of the parent organism. In amoeba, the division can occur in any plane throughout the body of the organism. This type of fission is known as simple binary fission. In some organisms, the division occurs in a fixed plane through specific axis, either horizontal or vertical. For example, in paramecium, the fission occurs in a transverse plane and is called transverse binary fission. While in euglena, the fission occurs through longitudinal axis and is called longitudinal binary fission. Let us perform an activity to understand the process of binary fission in amoeba using permanent slides. Activity To observe a permanent slide of amoeba under a microscope. Focus the permanent slide under a compound microscope, first under low power. Adjust the slide under high power. What do you observe? You would observe an unicellular amoeba showing no movement. Now let us observe a permanent slide of amoeba showing binary fission. Activity to observe a permanent slide of amoeba showing binary fission, the slide should be first focused under low power of a compound microscope and then adjusted to high power. Now, observe the slide. On observing the slide, we see that the process of binary fission in amoeba begins with the enlargement of the parent cell. After maximum growth is complete, the nucleus of amoeba undergoes division. The nuclear division is followed by cytoplasmic division. There is a constriction of the cell envelope and eventually two daughter cells are formed, each with an individual nucleus surrounded by cytoplasm. In this way, one parent amoeba divides to form two smaller amoebae through the process of binary fission. 
Thus, we can infer by observing both the slides that amoeba shows no structural organization and is found in irregular form. Few unicellular protozoans, like Leishmania, show more organized body which have a whip-like structure at one end of the cell. In such organisms, binary fission occurs in a definite plane. Leishmania is a parasite which causes disease called Kala Azar in humans. Certain unicellular organisms like Plasmodium, which is a malarial parasite, divides simultaneously into many daughter cells. These daughter cells are then released from the parental cell as single individuals. This process of reproduction in Plasmodium is called multiple fission. Let us study another mode of reproduction in unicellular organisms. Fragmentation Fragmentation is a form of asexual reproduction wherein the organism splits itself into fragments. These fragments on maturation breaks and develop into individual fragments. Activity Let us perform a very simple activity of mounting of filaments found in pond water. Collect slimy green filaments from a pond in a glass bottle or a watch glass. Put one or two filaments on a slide and put a drop of water. Put a cover slip and observe it under the compound microscope. The green filaments collected from the pond water are algae. The freshwater filamentous forms of algae are Zygnema, Odogonium, Spirogyra, etc. On the slide we observe filaments of Spirogyra with ribbon-like chloroplasts. The filaments easily break into pieces. These pieces of filaments can grow into individual fragments. Let us study about this method of asexual reproduction. When enough quantity of water and nutrients are available, the spirogyra grow and undergo maturation. The filament of spirogyra undergoes rapid multiplication. Eventually, the filament breaks into two or more fragments. The cells in each of these individual fragments enlarge, followed by the increase in the number of cells due to subsequent mitosis. Thus, each fragment grows and develops into mature filament. Thus, we can understand that certain multicellular organisms like Spirogyra reproduce through the process of fragmentation. Spirogyra shows simple body organization and follows simple reproductive method. However, all multicellular organisms cannot divide cell by cell. For example, human beings are multicellular organisms and show a complex body organization. Specialized cells are organized as tissues and tissues are organized to form organs. These organs form an organ system which functions in a definite manner. In such organized organisms, cell-by-cell -cell division is not possible. Thus, such multicellular organisms need more complex ways to reproduce. A basic strategy used in multicellular organisms is that different cells perform different specialized functions. The process of reproduction in such organisms takes place through specific cells. These specific cells are capable of growing and proliferating. Regeneration Some animals possess a very high capacity of regeneration. 
they can reconstruct their entire body from the isolated body cells. There are specialized cells which carry out regeneration. Regeneration power can help some animals in their reproduction. Let us study more about this aspect of regeneration. The capacity to regenerate differs in different organisms and is found to be very high among some animals. For example, hydra, sponges, ribbon worm, starfish, planaria, etc. They are capable of reconstructing the entire organism just from a single cell of the body. Certain cells of the body become specialized to carry out regeneration. These cells proliferate by division and eventually increase in number. These cells later on develop into various cell types and tissues. Thus, help in the production of new organism. The changes in the cells take place in an organized manner which is referred as development. However, regeneration is different from reproduction as most of the organisms do not possess the characteristic to regenerate. Also, the organisms that possess this characteristic do not depend on any external force or any natural effect that would cause them damage and they are able to reproduce. Let us study the example of planaria, which is a type of flat worm. When planaria is cut into many pieces, each piece develops into an entire organism. This process occurs only if the body of planaria somehow gets cut up into pieces. But animals cannot depend on this event for the process of reproduction to occur. Hydra uses its regenerative cells for its reproduction. Let us study this process. Budding Budding is another method of asexual reproduction. The term bud means a small outgrowth from the body of a living organism. In budding, a small part of the body of the parent organism grows out as a bud and then detaches and becomes a new organism. Animals like hydra, sea anemones, sponges and corals reproduce by this method. Organisms such as hydra use regenerative cells for its reproduction. This process is known as budding. Hydra is a simple multicellular animal that reproduces asexually by budding. It lives in fresh water and its body has a central cavity. It has thread-like structures at its anterior end called tentacles. Budding takes place when hydra reaches maturity and is well fed. During budding, the body wall of an adult hydra produces a small outgrowth or bud from the stalk or side of its body. This is due to repeated mitotic cell division at one specific site. The bud then gradually grows in size to form a small hydra by developing a mouth and tentacles at the free end. The young hydra gets its nourishment from the parent hydra. When the young hydra is sufficiently developed, a constriction appears at the point of contact and the tiny new daughter hydra detaches itself from the mother hydra and leads an independent life as a separate organism. In this way, the hydra reproduces asexually by growing buds from its body by the process known as budding. Remember, the bud formed in a hydra is not a single cell but a group of cells. Vegetative Propagation Observe some common plants. 
The sweet potato is a climber which shows fleshy roots. These fleshy roots are modified adventitious roots. These roots are useful for reproduction. We can develop new plants from the root cuttings. The leaf of bryophyllum plant shows presence of foliar buds which develop into small plantlets on the notches of leaf margin. The potato plant shows development of potatoes at the end of the branches. The potato is an underground stem tuber. The stem tuber has buds in the axils which we call as eyes of potato. A new plant develops from the pieces having eyes on them. If we observe these three plants, roots, stem and leaf are involved in reproduction. When new plants are produced from the vegetative parts, namely roots, stems, leaves and buds, it is known as vegetative propagation. For example, new plants of potato develop from eyes or buds on potato, bryophyllum reproduces from the bud on the leaf margin and the roots of sweet potato give rise to new plants. The plants produced by vegetative propagation are similar to the parent plants. They are produced from a single parent. Plants produced by vegetative propagation take less time to grow. They bear flowers and fruits earlier than those produced from seeds. Let us perform an activity to understand the process of vegetative propagation. Activity Take a potato. Observe its surface. What do you observe? You would observe notches or buds present on its surface. Slice the potato into pieces such that few pieces would contain the notches and few are without the notch. On a tray, spread some cotton and wet it. Place the pieces of potato on this cotton. Notice where the buds or notches are present on the potato. Observe the changes after a few days on the potato pieces. Make sure that the cotton is kept moistened enough for these days. What do you observe? You would observe that the potato pieces that had buds present on their surface shows development of green shoots and roots, whereas the potato pieces which did not have any notches do not show any development of the shoots or roots. Thus, we can conclude that the buds present on the surface of potato helps in the propagation of potato plant. Let us perform another activity to understand vegetative propagation with the help of a money plant. Activity Select a money plant and cut a piece of stem of money plant in such a way that it contains one node. A node is the point on stem where a leaf is attached. Also, cut a part of stem which do not bear any leaf. Immerse both the ends of stem in water. Let it stay for a few days. What do you observe? You would observe that the part of the stem bearing node shows development of new roots, whereas the part of the stem in between two leaves shows no development of roots. This happens because the stem does not get proper point to propagate. In this case, the node acts as a point for the propagation of new roots and thus no new roots develop on the stem which does not bear nodes. Let us now study a technique called tissue culture. Tissue culture Tissue culture relies on the fact that many plant as well as animal cells 
have the property of totipotency whereby they can regenerate a whole organism just from a single cell of the body tissue culture is a practice used to propagate plants or animals from a small piece of the tissue excised from the plant or animals in a suitable growth medium the steps involved in tissue culture should be strictly carried out under aseptic or sterile conditions possibly in a sterile cabinet a small tissue or a cell known as explant is taken from the growing part of the plant and placed in a culture medium the culture medium contains a jelly like substance known as agar along with the proper mixture of nutrients such as sugar vitamins and hormones it helps the plant tissue to multiply quickly plant tissue divides rapidly to produce a shapeless lump of cell known as callus callus is transferred to another nutrient medium containing plant hormones auxin and cytokinin these hormones stimulate the development of roots and shoots in the callus the callus having roots and shoots separates into tiny plantlets these plantlets are then transferred to the soil where they can grow to form a mature plant plant tissue culture offers several advantages over traditional methods of propagation it is possible to produce exact copies of plants that produce particularly good flowers fruits or have other desirable traits the production of plants under sterile conditions reduces the chances of transmitting diseases pests and pathogens it has become possible to produce disease resistant varieties of plants especially ornamental plants very little space is needed for developing new plants by tissue culture spore formation in a previous activity we have observed that the fungus grows on a piece of moist bread and forms cottony mass let us study reproduction in fungus the white cottony mass is formed by the growth of fungus rhizopus or bread mold the hyphae of bread mold or rhizopus are thread like structures there are rhizoidal hyphae which grow in the substratum the mold synthesizes spores inside a sporangium sporangium is present at the tip of the erect hyphae when the spores are ready to leave the sporangium breaks open the spores are released outside if the spores land in a moist place they germinate and form new mold this method is known as spore formation the fungus rhizopus reproduces by spore formation sexual reproduction sexual reproduction is another mode of reproduction observed in living organisms two parents are involved in sexual reproduction the sexes are separate in higher animals one male and one female parent are involved in sexual reproduction mainly two processes are involved in sexual reproduction meiosis and fertilization meiosis is a process in which the number of chromosomes is reduced to half the reproductive parent cell is diploid with two sets of chromosomes during meiosis reduction division occurs due to which the number of chromosomes is reduced from 2n to n resulting in the formation of haploid cells with a single set of chromosomes that is n these haploid cells undergo mitosis or equational division and form two identical cells each hence we get four haploid gametes from a single diploid reproductive parent cell 
Meiosis is followed by fertilization in which the haploid male gamete fuses with a haploid female gamete. This fusion results in the formation of a diploid zygote. This process restores the number of chromosomes from N in the gametes to 2N in the zygote similar to the original parent cell. In sexual reproduction, since the zygote is formed from cells inherited from two different parents, the offspring produced are somewhat different from each of the parents. Variations give rise to variety and diversity. They enable the organisms to adapt and survive in the constantly changing environment. Variations help to maintain the species and thus prevent the complete extinction of animal and plant species. Why the sexual mode of reproduction? The basic event in sexual reproduction is the creation of a DNA copy. Cells use chemical reactions to build copies of DNA. This involves copying of the DNA as well as the cellular machinery. During DNA copying, there is a possibility of errors due to which the DNA copying mechanisms cannot be considered as absolutely accurate and reliable. The occurrence of errors during DNA copying mechanisms is the source of variation in an organism. Several of these variations can be useful for the survival of the organism. Hence, there is a need to involve reproductive modes that allow more and more variations to be generated. The generation of variations within an organism is a fairly slow process. It is essential that the process of making variants should be speeded up to introduce favorable variations in an organism. During DNA copying, new variations are added to the already existing variations that have been inherited from the previous generations. The pattern of variation differs in different individuals. Combining variations from two or more individuals would create novel combinations of variants. Such a process of recombination of DNA can occur only during sexual reproduction. During sexual reproduction, the DNA from the male and the female gametes combines together to form the DNA of the zygote. However, the amount of DNA in the zygote does not get doubled. This is because the reproductive cells are haploid in nature and contain only half the amount of DNA or half the number of chromosomes as compared to that observed in the normal body cells of the organism. So, when a male gamete fuses with a female gamete, during sexual reproduction, the zygote formed receives the normal number of chromosomes. Now, if the zygote has to grow and develop into a new organism with highly specialized tissues and organs, it needs to have sufficient stores of energy. This means that either of the germ cells should be developed and act as a source of energy. In case of simple organisms, there is no remarkable difference in the germ cells. However, with the increase in the complexity of the organisms, the germ cells also specialize. One of the germ cells becomes larger and stores the food material. It is known as the female gamete. The other germ cell is smaller and likely to be motile. It is known as the male gamete. This variation in the type of germ cells has given rise to differences in the male and female reproductive organs leading to differences in the bodies of male and female organisms respectively. Sexual Reproduction in Flowering Plants Activity Visit a garden and observe a hibiscus flower plant. It is a shrub 
which bears solitary flowers. Pluck a single flower and observe its parts carefully. The flower has a long stalk on which all other floral parts are arranged. There is a receptacle at the end of the stalk on which sepals, petals, stamens and carpels are arranged. Sepals are united forming a cup-shaped structure which is green in color. The petals are five in number and are brightly colored. This is the large showy part of the flower. Stamen is the male reproductive organ of the plant. The stamens are raised above the petals. It consists of anther and filament. The delicate filaments bear anthers at the tip which are yellow in color. The filaments are united forming a central tube which starts from the base of the petals. We can observe a branch structure protruding from the central tube. This is a part of the carpel. Carpel is the female reproductive organ. It has a cap-like structure at its tip on which some of the yellow-colored pollen grains are attached. When we trace back this structure up to its base, we see a swollen structure at the base. It is the ovary which is present at the end of the long tubular structure. The flower is a reproductive organ of a plant. The different parts of a flower can be clearly seen if we take a longitudinal section of the flower. Flowers may be unisexual or bisexual. Unisexual flowers bear either stamens or carpels on a single flower. The flowers of papaya and watermelon are examples of plants bearing unisexual flowers. The flowers which bear both stamens and carpels in the same flower, such flowers are called bisexual flowers. Hibiscus and mustard are examples of plants bearing bisexual flowers. Now, we will study the process of sexual reproduction in case of flowering plants. Flower is a functional unit of sexual reproduction. The sepals, petals, stamens and carpels are the different parts of a flower. The carpel and the stamen are the parts of the flower essential for reproduction. Carpel is a female reproductive part of a flower. It is present in the center. It is made up of three parts, namely stigma, style and ovary. Stigma is terminal part of style which is sticky in nature. It is a receptive organ onto which pollen grains will germinate. Style is an elongated part of carpel which bears stigma at its tip. Ovary is the swollen lower part of the carpel containing one or more ovules. Each ovule has an egg cell which is the female germ cell. Stamen is a male reproductive part of a flower. It is made up of two parts namely anther and filament. Anther is usually bilobed and it produces pollen grains. Male germ cells are produced by pollen grains. The filament is the stalk of anther which raises the anther at the upper level. If carpels and stamens are necessary floral parts for sexual reproduction, then what is the function of sepals and petals in the flower? The sepals are usually green in color and they perform photosynthesis. They protect the floral parts in the bud condition. The petals are colored parts of a flower. The function of petals is to attract insects. Petals protect the reproductive organs which are situated on the inner side of the petals. Some of the flowers have attractive colors to attract insects for pollination. Pollen grains get stuck to the legs of insects. They are carried to the other flowers when the insect moves from one flower to another. These pollen grains germinate on stigma. 
Some plants have fragrance for attracting insects for the purpose of pollination. Let us now understand the process of pollination. Pollination The process of transfer of pollen grains from anther to stigma of a flower is called pollination. When the transfer of pollen occurs in the same flower or on another flower of the same plant, the process is known as self-pollination. If the transfer of pollen occurs from the anther to stigma of the same flower, then the process is known as autogamy. If the transfer of pollen occurs from anther of one flower to stigma of another flower on the same plant, then the process is known as gaitonogamy. If the pollen is transferred from anther of flower of one plant to the stigma of flower of another plant, then the process is known as cross-pollination. The agents of cross-pollination are wind, water or animals. The stigma acts as a receptive organ situated on the terminal part of style on which pollen germinates. Now, let us study about the process that takes place after the pollen lands on the stigma. Fertilization The pollen transferred from the anther germinates after it lands on the stigma. The pollen tube grows out from a pollen grain. It travels through the style to reach the ovary. Each pollen tube contains two male gametes. The male gametes are released near the egg cell present in the ovule. One male gamete fuses with the egg cell to form a diploid zygote. The second male gamete fuses with a secondary nucleus in the embryo sac to form endosperm. Endosperm is a nutritive tissue for the growing embryo. This process is called double fertilization because the two male gametes fuse with two different cells in the ovary. The zygote develops into an embryo. The embryo is capable of growing into a new plant. We will now study how an embryo develops further into a seedling with the help of an activity. Activity to understand the process of development of embryo into a seedling. Soak few seeds of Bengal gram in water and keep it overnight. Drain off the excess water and cover the seeds with wet cloth. Keep it undisturbed for a day. The next day, Open a seed carefully and observe its different parts. We can see that the seeds absorb water and become turgid, which marks the beginning of the process of germination. The radical comes out of the seed. Due to the pressure created, the outer seed coat is ruptured. On the same axis of radical, on the upper side, we can observe the swollen part of plumule. The fleshy white cotyledons store the food material. The process of development of embryo into a seedling is called germination. Let us now study the process of germination. After fertilization, the zygote divides several times to form an embryo within the ovule. The ovule develops into a seed. The ovary develops into the fruit. The seed contains the future plant, that is, the embryo. The seeds show outer seed coat, which breaks open so that the embryo further develops. Embryo shows radical or the future root and plumule or the future shoot. The seed develops into a seedling under favourable conditions. This entire process is known as germination. Reproduction in human beings 
We have already studied the different modes of reproduction in unicellular organisms and plants. Let us now study the mode of reproduction in human beings. In human beings, the reproductive system of males and females are different, with different organs performing a specific function. For example, special reproductive organs to produce sperms and eggs. Human beings can only reproduce after reaching sexual maturity. So, let us discuss about the age at which a person begins to mature sexually, the changes that occur in the body after sexual maturation, and the causes of these changes. We all undergo many changes from the time we are born. Our height and weight increases. We acquire milk teeth and even lose them. We again acquire a permanent set of teeth. These all changes can be considered under the general process of growth. But there are a whole new set of changes during the early teenage. The appearance of the body changes, new features starts developing and so do the new sensations. Some of these changes are common to both boys and girls. Growth of thick hair under armpits and in the genital areas can be noticed. The genital area, that is, the area between the thighs, grows darker. Development of thin hair can be seen on hands legs and even on face. The skin becomes oily and is prone to develop pimples. There are few set of changes that are not common in both boys and girls. In girls, breast size increases with darkening of the skin of the nipples at the tips of breast. Girls start menstruating at around this time. Boys develop thick hair growth on face and their voice becomes hoarse. All these changes take place over a period of months or even years. The changes do not happen all at the same time in one person, nor do they happen at an exact age. Some people acquire these changes too early while in others they happen very slowly. Similarly, each change does not occur or become quickly. All these changes are the aspects of the body depicting sexual maturity. Do you know why does the body start developing these characters at a particular age? In multicellular organisms, specialized cells perform specific functions. Plants develop special cells and tissues to carry out the process of fertilization. Similarly, humans develop specialized tissues and germ cells to participate in sexual reproduction. After crossing the age of 10 or 11 years, there are sudden noticeable changes in the growth pattern. The body begins to undergo rapid changes leading to reproductive maturity. The period of life when the body undergoes these changes is called adolescence. The age of adolescence varies greatly from person to person. It begins around the age of 11 and lasts up to 18 or 19 years of age. As this period covers the teens, adolescents are also called teenagers. Adolescence in girls begins one or two years earlier than the boys. Adolescence ends at adulthood. The changes that take place during adolescence mark the onset of puberty. The period of life when the body becomes capable of reproduction is known as puberty. It normally starts at 12 to 14 years in boys and 10 to 12 years in girls and varies from person to person. 
several changes occur in the body during puberty. These changes do not occur instantaneously. It takes many years for the body to undergo these changes. Puberty ends when an adolescent reaches reproductive maturity. How are all these changes related to the process of reproduction in humans? The sexual reproduction means fusion of two germ cells from each individual to form a zygote. This can happen either by release of germ cells from the body of an individual externally, as in case of flowering plants, or it can happen by internal transfer of germ cells for the fusion, as in case of many animals. Humans can undergo the process of sexual reproduction only after attaining sexual maturity. Thus, the changes that take place during the puberty are the signals that sexual maturation is taking place. On the other hand, the actual transfer of germ cells or gametes between two individuals requires special organs for the act. For example, in case of humans, males and females have specialized organs to carry out this process. In humans, the male discharges the sperm inside the body of the female. The sperm fuses with the ovum released from the female reproductive system to form a zygote. This zygote grows and develops inside the body of the female. The female reproductive organs and breasts need to mature to accommodate the changes occurring in the body. Let us now study about the systems involved in the process of reproduction in humans. Male Reproductive System The main reproductive organs of the male reproductive system are a pair of testes and penis. The other male reproductive organs are scrotum, epididymis, sperm ducts or vas deferens, seminal vesicles, prostrate gland and urethra. Testes are the oval-shaped organs that lie outside the abdominal cavity of a man. They are enclosed in a small, thin, walled, muscular pouch called scrotum or scrotal sac that lie outside the abdominal cavity. Testes function efficiently at a temperature slightly below the body temperature. Hence, they are held outside the abdominal cavity and in the scrotal sac so as to provide an optimal temperature for the storage of sperms. The function of the testes is to produce the germ cells or male gametes called sperms. The formation of germ cells or sperms in man begins at puberty and continues throughout his life. Testes also secrete the male hormone, testosterone. This hormone brings about changes like deeper voice, growth of thicker hair on the face in boys during puberty. The process of sperm formation is known as spermatogenesis. Each sperm is a single cell and small in size containing all the usual cell components. Testis produces millions of sperms. The immature sperms formed in testes travel into a coiled tube called epididymis. The sperms get matured and get stored temporarily in this long coiled tube. From epididymis, the sperms are carried to urethra through a long tube called vas deferens or the sperm duct. The urethra forms a common passage for both sperms and urine. Urethra carries sperms to penis, which opens outside the body. Penis is the organ of the reproductive system that delivers the sperms at the site of fertilization. 
along the path of vas deferens, prostrate gland and seminal vesicles secrete their secretions. These secretions makes the transport for sperms easy and also provides nourishment. Each sperm is composed of three parts, a head, a middle piece and a tail. The head part of the sperm consists of the genetic material. Sperms are motile and are able to move independently in the fluid medium because of the tail. They move towards the egg or female germ cell. Sperms can survive for a period of 24 to 72 hours in the female reproductive system and later die and degenerate. Female Reproductive System Ovaries, oviduct, uterus and vagina are the main reproductive organs of a female reproductive system. Ovaries are two oval-shaped organs present inside the abdominal cavity of a woman's body. The function of ovaries is to produce eggs or ova. The process of formation of an egg cell is called oogenesis. Ovaries also secrete a hormone called estrogen, which brings about changes like feminine voice, development of mammary glands in girls during puberty. When a girl is born, the ovaries already contain thousands of eggs. These eggs are immature and remain inactive till maturity. On reaching puberty, some of these eggs starts maturing. The mature egg is released from the ovary. This process is called ovulation. The egg released from the ovary goes into the oviduct or fallopian tube. The oviduct or fallopian tubes are tubes with funnel-shaped openings which cover the ovaries. The fertilization of an egg with the sperms takes place in oviduct. The oviducts connect to a bag-like structure called the uterus or womb. Uterus is a muscular organ. The growth and development of the fertilized egg takes place in the uterus. Due to strong muscles and its ability to expand and contract, the uterus can accommodate a growing baby. The uterus is connected to the vagina through a narrow muscular opening called the cervix. The vagina is a muscular tube-like structure that leads from the uterus and opens outside of the body. The vagina is the part that receives the male penis and forms the pathway through which sperms enter into the female's body. It is through the same pathway a baby comes out of the woman's body during childbirth after the completion of development inside the uterus. This is why the vagina is also called the birth canal. In females, one egg is released from one of the ovaries into the oviduct every month. When the egg is released from the ovary, the inner walls of the uterus start to become thicker. The thick linings of uterus are richly supplied with blood to nourish the growing embryo. The sperms actively swim and travel upwards through the cervix into the uterus to the oviduct of the female reproductive system. A single sperm mates with the egg in the oviduct and fertilization takes place. During fertilization, the nucleus of the sperm fuses with nucleus of the egg to form a single nucleus. This fertilized egg is called zygote. The zygote begins to divide into many cells and moves towards the uterus. This developing zygote is called embryo. The embryo moves down from the oviduct into the uterus 
and gets embedded in the soft and thick lining of the uterus. This is called implantation. When the embryo gets implanted into the uterus, the woman is said to be pregnant. The development of embryo takes place inside the uterus. As the embryo develops, it encloses itself within a thin lining called amnion. The amnion is filled with a watery liquid called amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid acts as a shock absorber and prevents the embryo from physical damage by jerks or mechanical shocks. It also restricts the movement of the embryo. Gradually, the embryo develops and starts resembling the human form. The unborn baby at a stage when all its body parts can be identified is called a fetus. The fetus gets all the nutrients and oxygen from its mother's blood. The fetus is attached to the uterus by a special structure called placenta. Placenta is a disc-like structure which is embedded in the uterine wall. It contains villi which are present on the embryo's side. On the mother's side, blood spaces are present which are surrounded by villi. This provides large surface area for the transport of materials like glucose and oxygen from the mother's body to embryo. Attached to the navel of the fetus is a flexible tube called umbilical cord. Umbilical cord runs from fetus to the walls of the uterus and is richly supplied with blood vessels. The umbilical cord connects the fetus to the mother's circulatory system. The mother's blood does not get mixed with the blood of the fetus. However, this connection supplies oxygen and food substances to the fetus. Waste substances like carbon dioxide diffuse across the placenta from the fetus through the mother's circulatory system. It takes about 38 weeks or 9 months for a fetus to develop from the fertilized egg. During pregnancy, the fetus is fully dependent on the mother for its nourishment and growth. Thus, the mother must take adequate food rich in nutrients to meet the needs of the developing baby. The body of mother excretes waste, breathes for it, keeps it warm, and also protects it from any damage and disease. When the development of fetus is complete, the mother gives birth to the baby. The fully formed baby comes out from the mother's body through vagina. The newborn baby completely depends on its mother and feeds on her milk. The child is born as a result of rhythmic contractions of the muscles in the uterus. Have you ever wondered what would happen if the egg released from one of the ovaries does not fertilize with the sperm? If the egg does not fertilize with sperm, the inner lining of the uterus starts shedding. The egg, the thickened lining of the uterus along with blood vessels and other uterine tissues is shed off as blood and mucus. This results in bleeding from the vagina in women. This is called menstruation. Menstruation lasts for about 5 to 8 days. Menstruation occurs once in about 28 to 30 days because ovulation occurs every 28 days. Reproductive health The population of our country is increasing rapidly day by day. There is a very strong relation between high national fertility rate and measures of poverty. As the population density increases, per capita income decreases, followed by the depletion of natural resources. It creates an economical burden on the nation. General health also goes down. 
large families not only affect individual but also community life. Economic pressure, mother's poor health, children neglected at home, poor housing, malnutrition, insufficient medical care, lack of better education are some of the disadvantages of a large family. A small family is advantages to the individual as well as to the nation and ultimately to the entire human race. Family planning can be done by practicing birth control measures. Birth control can be either by preventing pregnancy in females or by adopting a method by which the sperms produced are prevented from fertilizing the ovum. All birth control methods can be broadly classified into three categories, namely the barrier methods, chemical methods and the surgical methods. Let us discuss all these methods of contraception in brief. Barrier methods Barrier methods of preventing pregnancy involves the use of physical devices such as condoms and diaphragms. Males use condoms as a covering on the penis while the females use diaphragms to cover the cervix. Condoms as well as diaphragms act as a barrier and prevent the sperms from meeting the ovum and fertilizing it. Chemical methods Chemical methods of preventing pregnancy involves the use of pills. The females use two types of pills, namely oral pills and vaginal pills. The oral pills, also called as oral contraceptives, which contain hormones or chemical substances which stop the ovaries from releasing ovum into the oviduct. The vaginal pills, on the other hand, contain chemicals called spermicides which kill the sperms. It is necessary that the pills are consumed at the appropriate time to avoid hormonal imbalance in the body. Intrauterine Contraceptive Device IUCD The use of intrauterine contraceptive devices like the loop and copper tea is very effective in preventing pregnancy. A copper tea is placed inside the uterus. It prevents the implantation of fertilized egg in the uterus. However, these devices can cause side effects due to the irritation caused in uterus. Surgical methods Surgical methods of contraception are available for both males and females. For males, small portion of the sperm duct or vas deferens is removed by surgery and both the cut ends are tied properly. This prevents the sperms from coming out. This surgical procedure carried out in males is called vasectomy. In females, a small portion of the oviducts are removed by surgery and the cut ends are tied properly. This prevents the ovum from entering into the oviduct. This surgical operation carried out in females is called tubectomy. Thus, Surgical methods can be used to create such blocks. Surgical methods are safe in the long run, but the process of surgery can cause infections and other problems if not performed properly. Surgical method can also be used for removal of unwanted pregnancies. However, these methods of surgery can be misused by the people who do not want a particular child. This results in illegal sex-selective abortion of female fetuses. For a healthy society, the sex ratio of males and females needs to be maintained. Due to reckless killing of female fetuses, 
child sex ratio is declining at an alarming rate in some sections of our society these practices of determining sex and abortion of fetus is prohibited by the law another problem related to human reproduction is the spread of sexually transmitted diseases that is stds syphilis gonorrhea aids are some common sexually transmitted diseases which affects sexual health of human beings sexually transmitted diseases spread from an infected person to a healthy person by sexual contact sex education and definite preventive measures are necessary to protect individuals from these sexually transmitted diseases